So good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome to today's webinar uh, from Pentex Medical. Um, I'm, my name is Monique Dalton, and I am the product marketing segment leader for ERCP and Hygiene Solution, and it gives me great pleasure to warmly welcome you to today's webinar. We actually have a broad reach across the globe, so warm welcome. We have North, South and Central America, Canada, Russia, UK, Ireland, um, Southeast Asia, New Zealand, and of course, uh, Europe. So a very, very warm welcome to you all. Um, before I do the introductions and before we start the webinar, um, if you could all please mute your microphone, this will ensure a smooth running for today's session. Um, and as you have seen from the lineup, uh, we have an exciting webinar ahead of us and uh, our three key experts will be discussing the topic whether COVID-19 has uh, improved the focus on the importance of hygiene and infection control in endoscopy. So a warm welcome to all of our key ex experts. And from Italy, we have Professor Cesara Hassan. He's the head of GI endoscopy at Nuovo Regina Margarita Hospital in Rome, Italy. And he's also the treasurer of ESGE. So warm welcome Thanks, to Zaha. Welcome um, everyone. We also have Ulrike Beilenhoff from Germany. She's the Estina Scientific Secretary and Endoscopy Nurse. Warm welcome Ulrike. Hello. And we also have uh, Paul Cesar, our very own uh, reprocessing and infection control leader at Pentax Medical, and he's joining us today from the Netherlands. So welcome, Paul. Okay, welcome to all of you. Um, and just to give you a bit of an overview of today's webinar, uh, it will run for around about an hour, uh, give or take, depending on how many questions we have from you all. And um, first of all, we're going to touch um, the point about the ESGE and SGENA guidelines on COVID-19 from three different perspectives, from the clinician's perspective, from the nurse perspective, and also from reprocessing perspective. And after which we'll have a nice live discussion between our three experts and also address uh, the questions which you have. And then afterwards, we're going to move uh, more into uh, the compliance to the guidelines uh, from the nursing and clinician's perspective. And again, finishing that off with a live discussion and Q&A. So I'd like to take this opportunity to um, invite you all. Uh, when you have questions, please feel free to type them into the questions box. And uh, we want to, to, don't be shy. We want to really invite you to ask questions and really, really be involved with this active discussion and opportunity to discuss this with our live experts today. And with that in mind, I would like to hand you over to Ulrika to start the first of the presentations. Thank so, you. Thank, thank you very much, uh, much uh, Monique, for the nice uh, introduction and uh, great to have you all here. I hope you can hear everything and please, as Monique said, um, ask a lot of questions so that we have a lively discussion. So we have uh, different regulations which um, are established and the head of that is um, usually the World Health Organization and also the European Center of, uh, Con uh, Center of Disease Control in Europe. And um, these regulations were then um, brought down to the national law. So ESG and SGNA together um, have already developed now two um, statements. One was pu already published in April this year. And uh, the update on that uh, guideline or a statement is now submitted to endoscopy and will soon be available uh, also for you. And we will mention a lot of points for that. So the updated guideline says that even in the post lockdown phase, these um, health and safety issues, uh, infection control policies are very important. So they remain in place and they cover a lot of these aspects from training um, to uh, PPE and to uh, patient tracking. And we come to that later. So the aim is really also in this post lockdown phase to reduce potential risks and to ensure patient and staff health, uh, safety. 
um, have a look at the first uh, statement. Um, the, um, it says that uh, the entire um, staff in endoscopy unit should appropriately be trained and informed about uh, the health and safety strategies. And this uh, not only cover the COVID issues, but also PPE and hygiene measures and also interventions like separation and isolation. And the aim is really to have during the endoscopy procedure fully trained endoscopy personnel, but no, not only trained in uh, endoscopy procedures, but also trained in all these hygiene issues around COVID-19. That is important really to ensure uh, health and safety during the procedure. And uh, we also um, have uh, the opinion that we should not do any uh, different uh, protection measures between the different procedures. So the, we um, say we um, need to have um, universal precaution, um, both for upper and, GI, uh, upper and lower GI endoscopy. What does it mean? We use the same um, level of um, um, staff protection measures. So we have gloves and booties and um, a hairnet. The only difference is um, the surgical mask or the respiratory mask like FFP2 and 3 masks. And only in high risk patients and positive patients, we have to, uh, we have to use this FFP2 and 3 masks. Nevertheless, a lot of units now use um, the FFP2 and 3 masks also for all patients just to have these universal precaution. And you'll see here pictures from the, um, uni uh, from the endoscopy unit. Um, what remains after the COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic? Um, as Gina already prepared a poster um, which describes the um, doning and doffing of um, um, uh, personal protective equipment. Uh, we were requested to do this and uh, to offer this especially for endoscopy procedures. And this can also be easily adapted to um, reprocessing areas. So it is a short, there are short versions available and also more ver ver versions with uh, more um, explanations. So that uh, I think is very helpful also for the post um, um, pandemic phase. For patients and staff healthy uh, safety, um, it is important that uh, the staff uh, do a triage also for itself. That means a self-assessment. Um, do I have any symptoms? Do I have any risk factors? And in a lot of countries nowadays, uh, the staff is also tested. Um, and if uh, there is uh, the question that uh, staff has unprotected uh, contact to um, um, positive patients, then uh, also staff has to go into isolation and quarantine. The guideline also mentioned a lot of general uh, recommendations concerning hand hygiene uh, and also not sharing mobile phones, pens, computer places or medical equipment, uh, not to spread the um, viruses and also give uh, a lot of recommendations concerning cleaning and disinfection um, with virucidal agents. And that is the uh, normal um, substances what we usually use in endoscopy. All the departments also need hygiene plans to clean the rooms properly. The guideline also give um, uh, information about the um, patient pathways. That means the patient should wear also face masks in endoscopy units. Relatives are not allowed and um, the units should have separate waiting and recovery areas for high risk patients and also dedicated endoscopy rooms Preferably, they should have um, negative pressure rooms, which is not always available. But uh, sometimes uh, the endoscopy units also then go to the OR um, units and uh, Cesare will go into detail with that. Um, a number of um, bodies also develop helpful charts, which can be helpful to decide, should I go into, as a staff, should I go into quarantine or not? And this is just one example um, to, to uh, make a self-assessment. So what remains after COVID-19? I think the social distance will be our new norm normality. Um, so we definitely have to also change our cultural behaviors. We don't shake any hands anymore. And we also establish a lot of physical barriers like here on this uh, welcome desk to have a, um, a physical barrier and a protection um, when we have close contact to people. Patients and staff wear face masks all over the hospital and also in endoscopy units. 
And uh, the, the separation of uh, patient areas, I think that will also be a normal, um, the, no, the new normality um, for us for in the next months. And I think we have to take this uh, into account. And for the team organization at the moment, um, the uh, teams often um, split the shifts and group uh, nurses and doctors in um, separate uh, groups. I think that, have, um, that will uh, take place um, a little bit longer. And we also have to think about the um, re-establishing of training. At the moment, it is not possible that new staff um, stay with us in the endoscopy unit. So we have to find new structures to uh, reinstall training, perhaps with transmission into an, uh, a lecture hall or whatever. So we need uh, there to think about new structures for training new staff. So you know SARS-CoV-2 is an enveloped virus. That means we can use our uh, normal disinfectants, which uh, usually have a virucidal activity. So that also means we don't have to change the reprocessing of flexible endoscopes. Really, we just have to follow the existing guidelines. Um, but we uh, should take um, uh, special protection uh, measures also during reprocessing. That means we also have to wear FFP2 and 3 masks when we um, reprocess uh, contaminated equipment after COVID-19 cases. So concerning the reprocessing, what remains uh, after COVID-19, um, there is clearly a trend towards two separate rooms, so a clean and a contaminated uh, reprocessing area, um, which should have enough um, work surfaces and sinks. And at the sinks, I think nowadays there should be protection lids, um, which protect the stuff uh, against uh, splashes. Um, and in addition, um, to the normal um, PPE, these uh, shields can be very helpful um, to uh, protect the stuff. And I think that should be one of our new structures for reprocessing areas. So compliance to guidelines is often very difficult. And a study from um, Ofsted showed that especially in manual uh, cleaning and uh, steps, um, brushing and drying are often um, skipped when there is a high time pressure. Um, and even the staff says, okay, 90% of the nurses said, yeah, manual reprocessing is important. But under time pressure, 75% of the um, reprocessing staff reported to skip reprocessing steps. And that were mainly the manual cleaning and the drying. So that is very crucial um, in the um, effect of the um, um, cleaning. So um, we, uh, ESG and as Gina said, we want to have uh, reprocessing st staff which have no competing responsibilities, which is dedicated staff just for reprocessing um, areas. Uh, this staff should have a formal training with competency assessment and the training and the knowledge have to be refreshed with refresher courses. Therefore, as Gina developed a curriculum for endoscope reprocessing, which is available on our website, and it consists of six modules and cover um, three days to five days training. So what remains for, uh, after COVID-19 concerning the standardized reprocessing? Um, I think we have to look into the SOPs uh, for reprocessing and each um, different endoscopy uh, type needs its own SOP so that uh, the cleaning can be increased and we really need an additional training on these aspects. The nurses and the cleaning staff uh, need to know each different, uh, each single uh, channel system of uh, the single endoscopes and also components like here the distal uh, tip of the um, duodenoscope. And that also includes lone endoscopes. Um, there will be definitely an increase of disposable devices, and I'm sure we will discuss that later. Um, these disposable de devices really ensure um, a safe cleaning and makes um, the work um, quite easier for the nurses because these single-use devices don't have to be cleaned and just uh, throw away. 
What we should not forget is the um, decontamination of the services. Uh, that is what we also learned from COVID-19, that um, uh, the services are important to be decontaminated. Uh, and again, also in reprocessing areas, um, personal belongings like mobile phones, pens, computers should not be shared. So that, is my, that was my first part, um, giving you um, a small, um, yeah, the nurse's perspective on this topic. And I would now like to um, switch to Paul um, Cesar. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Ulrika, for your um, insightful presentation. And um, you brought up some really interesting topics. And I think, Paul, will, this is a nice bridge between yourself and also the reprocessing perspective with regards to importance of training, um, minimizing the risk of infection due to single use accessories such as the brushes and also the valves and also touching on the viricidal uh, effect or components of the disinfection solution. So with that in mind, thank you very much. And I'd like to hand over now to Paul to give uh, the reprocessing perspective with regards to the ESG and SGNA guidelines for COVID. Thank you, Paul. Okay. Well, thank you for the introduction and uh, Monique and uh, also for uh, <clears throat> bringing this nice bridge, uh, Ulrike, for, to my presentation, which is titled, Does COVID-19 Bring Back the Importance of uh, Endoscope Reprocessing to Front and Center? Well, this is the, I hope, yeah, it's, uh, it's a little bit slow, but it, it works. Well, during the COVID-19 episode, we, uh, got a lot of questions but the most important and the most frequent asked questions was are the chemicals we use for the reprocessing of our flexible endoscopes are these effective against the COVID-19 virus so we thought it was all about reprocessing and all those uh, things uh, included but the main question was only on the chemicals used and Ulrike told us also uh, something uh, on this subject. Well, it's well said, and there were many studies uh, and statements uh, and claims that were already uh, published on the susceptibility on, on the SARS-CoV-2 virus uh, to detergents and, and disinfectants, and this was nicely put down by uh, the well-known professor uh, Didier Pitet from Switzerland uh, in, in, in uh, uh, a publication and it's just saying the virus is very easy to kill it's not resistant and it's uh, um, very suspect, uh, susceptible to, to uh, steam heat ozone and to all those uh, disinfectants we are using also in endoscope reprocessing but do we have a problem with COVID-19 and flexible endoscopes is there a problem well there was a publication also from Corey Ofsted in May this year. On, it was on the 5th of May, the, the day of the worldwide day of, on hand hygiene, that she said inadequately reprocessed bronchoscopes may contribute to transmission of COVID-19 and other infections. So look at the word may. And as we look to the paper, uh, Sorry, uh, I, can I go back to the other slide? Yeah, it was only saying it was nothing was told on COVID-19 in this paper. So the title, the headline is a little bit tricking us. Um, it's all about bacteria. And um, but what on the viruses or even the SARS-CoV-2 virus? Nothing was said on that. And do we have a problem with viruses in, in endoscopy and endoscopy, endoscope reprocessing? Well, this is data from the ASGE guideline from 2018, uh, still saying existing data suggests that the risk of viral transmission via endoscopy is extremely low to non-existent. So what are we worrying about? And of course, we do have problems in endoscope reprocessing. Let us go back to, to the first steps 
or the most in, of the, or, or the steps in reprocessing flexible endoscopes. As we all know, uh, I assume we all know, these are the steps in reprocessing flexible endoscope. It starts with the bedside cleaning. Then we have the leak test, a dry leak test. Then we have the manual cleaning, uh, also with the leak test and a visual inspection, followed by a high level disinfection with a detergent and a disinfectant. Then, of course, the rinsing, and it was also pointed out in, in uh, the presentation of Ulrike, uh, the drying and storage, which is also very important and becoming more important. Well, all these steps in reprocessing are based on international guidelines, the manufacturer instructions for use, uh, and of course, local hospital protocols based on those guidelines and many, many studies and publications. So, there is nothing new, but despite all this paperwork, we all know that there are problems with uh, cleaning endoscopes and endoscopes are not clean after reprocessing, uh, which was uh, stated in many studies and publications with headlines like this. And even there was a recent paper from uh, Judith Kwakman and uh, Marco Bruno and Margrethe Voss from Erasmus Hospital in, in uh, Rotterdam, the Netherlands, post ESCP infection caused by contaminated duodenoscopes. So yes, we have a problem. And we know that problem for many years. And uh, it was also uh, uh, published in a nice paper from uh, Yulia Kovaleva in 2012. Um, most problems and outbreaks are related to ineffective cleaning and disinfection of the endoscopes, followed by contamination or failures of the uh, out, uh, automated endoscope reprocessor, or an ineffective dry procedure and storage. So contamination of flexible endoscope was seen in 63% uh, of all the outbreaks. Nothing new again, outbreaks versus reprocessing flexible endoscopes. The majority of reported outbreaks originated from non-compliance also with existing national and international guidelines as Ulrika also said, 75% of reprocessing staff reported time pressure and so non-compliance with guidelines. But it was also said that the positive effect was uh, on staff training and regular audits to ensure compliance with guidelines, so to a better positive uh, result. Uh, 10 years ago, this was stated in the Australian guidelines, the key message was always simple and clear. Clean it, clean it, and clean it. And there was a recent paper from, uh, I think, yeah, two years ago from a hospital in Austria. And uh, they say, uh, if uh, uh, we improve a, a high standard of cleaning and disinfection, the outcome of the endoscopes is better. So high quality endoscope reprocessing decreases endoscope reprocessing. But we all know when you uh, want to follow high standard procedures, it will cost time. This is also a paper of Corey Ofsted three years ago. Just look at the data. Uh, the manual cleaning step from dry leaking testage to re-cleaning and re-bristling uh, is only 44 minutes. So I doubt if any clinic, any reprocessing unit uh, does perform a manual cleaning like for 44 minutes. And that is the problem. That's the known problem in reprocessing flexible endoscopes. We don't look at the environment in this presentation, but look at the organization of endoscopy, uh, endoscopic activity. Excessive volumes. Um, only the last year, more than 1.6 million endoscopies were performed only in NHS hospitals in the United Kingdom. And there was an annual increase of endoscopies for, from more than 5% over the fi last five years. And that means also more than 5% increase of endoscopes reprocessed. So I doubt if all facilities in reprocessing have also increased their amount of endoscope, their staff capacity, the capacity of their automated endoscope washers, or even the capacity of their drying and storage. Uh, possibilities. So this is nothing new. It's all about the time pressure. 
and it's all about the money. So what do we learn from the COVID-19 uh, episode? It's time to wake up and change. There are a lot of publications on reopening and restarting an endoscopy unit, but not on restarting endoscopy reprocessing. So this is a, a, a paper from uh, uh, Italia and it says, well, we all have a call for reducing the workload in endoscopy units to appropriate rescheduling of procedures. Well, it means that we have a great chance to remodel and rationalize endoscopy uh, processes. And well, that gives us an opportunity to remodel and rationalize also the reprocessing. And then we come to the environment. Yeah, we have to make a step forward to a standard automatic reprocessing, even in the two room uh, sections, like Ulrike all, all already mentioned, uh, separate dirty and clean work surfaces. But also let's uh, 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 start with volumes based on staff allocation and equipments available. So minimize disruption in endoscopy programs and, and uh, let's care uh, on staff allocation based on the real time needed for working conformity guideline and the IFUs. And that also means education and training. Reducing the workload is improving quality. So are we going back to the future? Um, yes, let's implement a, re a robust basic and periodic training program on reprocessing flexible endoscopes that is competent-based, certif certificated, and uh, it should be skilled and, and competent, the, the staff. Uh, the guidelines and manufacturer's instructions for use no, should always be respected and followed. No, they must always be respected and followed. Production levels in endoscopy units must be based on available endoscopes, the number of reprocessing staff, and the real turnover time of reprocessing an endoscope, the throughput capacity and the throughput time, and even calculating the downtime uh, needed for uh, maintenance, servicing, self-disinfection, and even more becoming more important, the testing programs, the microbiological sampling. So indeed, we have to look at patient scheduling, staffing levels. Uh, we have to look, the management also should be knowledgeable about all those IFUs. They don't have a notice on, on it. They, they don't have the knowledge on this. And we can have uh, uh, make we could make a step forward uh, in that, and of course all the personnel involved they should have the training uh, and regular training and uh, and the competency. So I think also uh, yeah maybe it should be time for, learned from COVID nineteen episode uh, that we implement one robust European guideline on reprocessing flexible endoscopes for every hospital, healthcare, endoscopy center with a strict compliance with uh, certified centers and, and nurses and staff and completed by audits. And we have such a guideline already. And um, while we have such a guideline, we should say, do we need a change from recommendations to more indispensable measures like mandatory? Thank you very much, Paul. <laughs> um, actually, we have some questions. Um, thank you very much to our participants. Um, so I think the first one I would address then to you, Paul. Um, there was a question um, for the future. Is there a plan to include also the virus in the testing and not just focusing on microbiological or bacterial testing? Uh, yeah, we had discussed this already for many years because we do virus testing when there is a problem in endoscopy reprocessing and we have a, a, a call on patients back. Then we do a, a, a virus testing on H by uh, HBV virus, uh, HCV uh, and uh, HIV virus. So hepatitis and, and HIV virus. Um, yeah, we discussed it also in the Netherlands a few years ago, but they say, well, uh, no, we don't do that because 
the common problems are with bacteria and viruses are more susceptible to all those cleaning procedures and disinfectants more than bacteria are. But uh, Paula, I guess that uh, it shouldn't be COVID uh, to force us to do also viral no. uh, check because at the end COVID is not a risk uh, for the next patient, no. it's only a risk uh, for the staff, uh, etc. So I mean, you can move and you can complicate our life, uh, but please don't do this uh, for COVID when you didn't do for HIV, hepatitis and blah, blah, blah. No. No. So in my opinion, uh, it has no value, added, uh, added value to, to uh, do periodic uh, viral testing. Thanks, Paul, you're our friend. <laughs> okay, we like thank you. you. <laughs> <laughs> we have another one here. Um, uh, could you uh, tell us which is the best way to store endoscopes uh, during this uh, Mm, sorry, during this COVID period and potentially then due to the last discussion between you both, not just now, but is, is, is there a difference in the way that you store endoscopes during this time to a normal time, for example? Um, yes. Um, because in many countries, uh, um, do you hear me? Uh, I don't hear something. Yes, Paula, we can hear okay. you well. Okay, because it, uh, it said my mic was uh, muted. Now, uh, storage of endoscopes, uh, it's becoming more and more important. There was a nice publication earlier this year, I thought two weeks ago, on the importance on drying endoscopes. And in many countries, uh, wet endoscopes are still used uh, within four hours or even uh, after more than four hours because some uh, um, institutes don't have the, uh, the, the good capacity to, to dry endoscopes. Um, and endoscope drying is, of course, also, uh, as I uh, mentioned in my presentation, it needs time. And drying an endoscope in an endoscope cabinet, uh, drying cabinet, it, it allows uh, 90 minutes at minimum to have a dry endoscope. Uh, and there are still countries allowed, uh, uh, they allow to use a wet endoscope after cleaning and disinfection coming out of the machine and use within four hours. So there is a wet endoscope uh, used. Uh, why? Because it's uh, all, again, uh, the question on the capacity, the high turnover, uh, the production, and uh, not the time available, the 90 minutes to dry the endoscope. But I think there is a slight moving, uh, changing in the field that the, some guidelines are now recommend to use always a dry endoscope. Ola, you are too, too clever for us. Do you think that uh, with COVID-19, uh, we should change uh, our approach uh, on a storage? I mean, do you believe uh, that we can have uh, environmental contamination uh, to our scope, I don't know, maybe you can have some splash of secretions uh, in the endoscopy room or uh, or blah, blah, blah. I mean, if you can have the, the, the scope under ozone until you don't use it, uh, maybe you can be safer. Yeah, I think there will be a great advantage in, in using uh, new techniques like, uh, as you mentioned, uh, the, 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 the fast drying of an endoscope, for example, with, with plasma typhoon, using a, a small amount of ozone for an aseptic individual, individual packed endoscope. So not 10, 12 endoscopes hanging in the storage cabinet, putting out, no, each endoscope is packed aseptic for uh, ready for use. Yeah, I think this is uh, important because uh, Ulrike, uh, we experience uh, more time loss uh, in uh, decontaminating the environment. Uh, for instance, in cleaning uh, our endoscopy room uh, after each procedure, in ventilating. So actually, I I'm I'm somewhat uh, losing 15 to 30 minutes in between two procedures only to decontaminate. Uh, the environment and this prevent me to go back to full capacity. So I take the point, maybe there's not so much on the reprocessing, but on the decontamination of the environment, it's much more than it was before. Do you agree, Rick? 
Yeah, but in, in the, um, do you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. In, the, in, the, in the past, um, we really did not take into account the surface decontamination. We just uh, took off the patient, took the next patient on, uh, on the, yeah. um, let's say, table, whatever, yeah? So, uh, and it is good that we have a surface decontamination between patients. Um, a good thing might be to have dedicated staff who can help us with that, to have service staff that not the nurses or doctors uh, have to wait. So that is arranged in many uh, endoscopy units, but I think it, it is necessary, definitely. Okay, guys, uh, audience, we sit at home uh, just looking at this webinar very comfortable. Can you chat uh, if you are experiencing uh, a reduction in your capacity because of the time needed uh, to decontaminate the environment. Uh, Paul, please, can you invent something that uh, decontaminates faster the endoscopy room? Because we are, we are losing time. Eh? <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, faster. Um, we always want to do the things faster, but if it's also better, I doubt. Um, it needs some time to clean all those equipment to, 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 uh, in a proper way. So, yeah, how I, fast I, I is think, fast? Yeah. I, I think you also need to have enough uh, nurses or staff in, in the room. And if you have one endoscopist and one nurse, that is not enough. So you definitely need to have two nurses plus, a, mm -hmm. plus an endoscopist. And then you have perhaps uh, a service uh, staff who can help you. And then you have a quick turnover. Yeah, you clean the surfaces, yeah. you prepare the next patient, you do the interview in the meanwhile with the next yeah. patient. And that is a, a question of organization. And then it works. Yeah. 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 I feel that, Ulrich, this time you convinced me. So this yeah. time I need you. Now <laughs> yeah. we need the because... two nurses per room. I, I was a, a bit in yeah. doubt before COVID, but now I agree with you. There's so <laughs> much to do that now it's time to have two nurses per room. On this, today we agree, okay? I don't put me in the guideline, but we agree. Yeah. But also the cleaning staff and the service staff, as Ulrike mentioned, it's it's like the model of the OR. Mm -hmm. After each patient, there is a cleaning of the OR uh, by by some cleaning staff and and all the prepare the next patient for the OR. So yeah, it works there. So it could work in endoscopy. Yes. But uh, I must admit, Paul, that here uh, in Italy it was a disaster because we also experienced a shortage uh, of alcohol-based uh, uh, hmm. detergents. So uh, yeah. it was also quite difficult to to find them. So now, now, fortunately, things are much better. I mean, we have some more questions actually. If, um, before we move on to your part, Cesara, if that's okay. Yeah, go on, Manny, go on. We are curious. Okay. So uh, just going back to um, the last topic um, about the plasma typhoon, we have a question here, um, how the plasma typhoon and plasma bag is playing a role in the requirements, which you mentioned before, Paul, which you were highlighting. So how does that, how does that play a key role? Yeah, it, it plays a key role, but there is uh, always a but. Uh, in all traditional guidelines, it's still vertically storage is, is recommended. Uh, Paul, uh, can, can, Paul, can you explain, uh, yeah. Paul, can you explain for our audience uh, what plasma typhoon is? Because we know, but maybe not all the audience know exactly what it does. Yeah. So please explain okay. in simple words, because you are too clever, Paul, in yeah. simple words. Okay, Plasma Typhoon is, is, is just a, a smart device uh, which, which dries the uh, internal channels of the endoscope within just one to four minutes, depending on the, the kind of endoscope, uh, using uh, two air flows, a laminar flow and, and uh, another uh, flow um, to blow out the water and to completely dry the endoscope and putting some ozone in the endoscope in the low concentration, but a uh, uh, concentration that is enough to preserve the endoscope in a kind of aseptic way. Um, but it, Ola, it, Ola, while you are yeah. thinking, because you're very smart, do you advise this only for duodenoscope or also for upper lower GI uh, scope, where maybe the risk of uh, contamination is less clinically relevant? So, if I have plasma typhoon, should I use for all the scope or only duodenoscope? All the scopes because there are also 
outbreaks uh, uh, published on bronchoscopes, gastroscopes, and colonoscopes. So I think, uh, and of course, there is more risk with ESP duodenoscopes, but uh, let's do it for all, I think. I uh, fully agree. Um, so that was only plasma. Yeah, okay, that was only plasma typhoon, and, and it needs a horizontal storage, and that is uh, quite different from the traditional way of. Uh, storing endoscopes. It's mainly in the drying cabinets. It's a vertical way to store, to drip out the, the water from the endoscopes and, and air is blowing through the channels uh, for, for one hour, 90 minutes or even more to dry the endoscope. This is a very important so poll. Yeah. If you have any, any picture about this to show later for our audience, I mean, the possibility to have an horizontal storage is incredible. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I like it. So the endoscope is is really dry in 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 less than five minutes, and it's packed fully aseptic in in the bag, and uh, individually, and it can be moved uh, to to the endoscopy room. Yeah. Okay, Paul, you said one two minutes. Now you said less than five minutes. Just stop it here. If not, it is half an hour. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Uh, so we have some uh, a very lively audience, which is really great. Um, Thanks. Thanks for your questions. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, we have actually two questions, uh, a little similar, which is an interesting topic. Um, but before I move on to this, I think we can go back a little bit before we talked about the plasma typhoon. Um, and we have uh, a question here. So. In the hospitals, we divide uh, between an operation theatre, which um sorry sorry for this <laughs> uh in the hospitals we divide between an operation theater which can't be easily entered due to a double door system and Endos endoscopy rooms are assigned as intervention rooms should we change this and also in a double into a double door system i think that, i think this is a very a, a good point uh, because uh uh, we were not ready in uh, our uh, endoscopy room to deal uh, with uh, respiratory transmitted uh, infection while uh, OR were already used to. So probably it's time also uh, for us to move to double room uh, so that, for instance, you can do the doffing outside uh, and then you can enter only when uh, you are uh, fully uh, protected. Of course, uh, we need to look at the investment because uh, COVID-19 uh, is uh, somewhat uh, shading away. And I don't know how much effective uh, it would be such a big uh, investment, but uh, certainly for the future endoscopy rooms, the one who, that need to be bit up, uh, Paul, I feel this is a great advice to prevent uh, respiratory infections. Mm. Yeah, it was also recommended many years ago after the SARS and the Mexican flu to have uh, so, yeah. such uh, rooms. And even it was advised uh, on bronchoscopy rooms because of the tuberculosis, uh, of course. And uh, as far as I know, uh, these recommendations were never adapted till now. But uh, Ulrich, I think this for our... Uh... New update of the endoscopy service is something that we should take into consideration. Anyway, we have to I mean, infrastructure that can prevent the transmission of uh, respiratory virus. Yeah, especially the uh, ventilation systems. I think we have we have to do, keep into account. Yeah. Yeah, this is also very important. I and mean, when yeah. when you do long procedure, you are at risk not so much for yourself but for outside because uh, we don't have a negative pressure. So yeah. probably even this is extremely mm. important. Also because, Paul, I feel now that you have some portable uh, device to do the negative pressure, so. Uh, I don't know. I've not seen them, no. Monique, do we have another question? Maybe an easy yeah. one, eh? These are very yeah, difficult. okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, I can't control this. We have a very a very smart audience with us, so. Yeah, yeah we have a question here. Actually, yeah, we have that's good. Two similar questions uh, coming from Sarah and also Sylvia uh, regarding single use endoscopes. And basically, um, the question is uh, from Sarah How do you see the role of single use endoscopes post COVID 19? So, for example, not just related to GI, but also within pulmonary urology, et cetera. And this ties in also with Sylvia's question 
um, about the importance of single-use devices in endoscopy and whether you all think that this is the future. Okay, guys, I don't feel that uh, it would be COVID-19 uh, to move to the single-use endoscope because uh, it is unclear at this stage if there is any clear uh, uh, advantage. So we can go back uh, to the endoscopy-related infection that Paul uh, mentioned. I consider, Paul, COVID an endoscopist-related infection. But uh, I take the point that for endoscopy, related uh, a single-use scope uh, uh, can be a reasonable uh, a response, uh, such as also the use of the uh, single-use uh, uh, deck. So probably we are moving uh, in, uh, in this direction. I mean, to, to understand the impact is something that we want to work on. Probably we will address uh, Rick also this uh, uh, officially, but we need uh, more data, we need to, we need to have uh, more more clear ideas. It's, it's, it's definitely a, a sandable a project, but I don't guess it is COVID-19 to boost it to an immediate uh, application. I don't know, Paul, if uh, your smart mind agrees. Yeah, I fully agree with you. Because the main problems are with bacteria and biofilms and not with viruses. OK. Okay. And it is also a good point yeah, but... if you have on-call services like in bronchoscopy and so on. So that is also a logistical uh, discussion behind that. Um, that if you have on-call systems that perhaps you have then um, single-use equipment available. Yeah, this is very interesting, Rick. You are right. I mean, uh, when you are on-call late at night, etc., probably a single-use scope uh, would make sense. Yeah. It makes yeah. sense to Even me. if intensive care need a and bronchoscope, yeah. they just can pick up the single-use uh, device and then they don't have any problems with cleaning and disinfection afterwards. Yeah, all our anesthesiologists have the, yeah. do the intubation, they have a, a disposable mm -hmm. uh, yeah. device. So yeah, probably in this setting, it makes sense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And this actually ties in really nicely with the, with the next question. Um, do you feel uh, that COVID-19 has accelerated the acceptance and progression from reusable, uh, not just endoscopes, but also accessories such as brushes, um, distal end caps and valves uh, with regards to reprocessing? I mean, I, I can go first. I feel that everything that uh, simplifies uh, reprocessing uh, is uh, helpful in uh, this setting. Of course, uh, Ulrich, uh, and Paul said, oh, guys, nothing changed, so don't be worried. But then I don't remember who between the two showed that uh, there is a lot of uh, non-compliance uh, with the uh, current recommendation. Rick, we are always very hairy. Uh, we don't have uh, the available infrastructure. So for instance, uh, I advise uh, FFPQ, if available, for all the technicians or nurses performing reprocessing. So in, if this is the case, if it is not easy to have a state of the art reprocessing, I feel that um, single use accessories make sense. Of course, if they are uh, also convenient. Eh? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess this poses the question, as Paul mentioned before, is uh, health risk versus cost. You know, it's a health economics yeah. versus cost of infection. So I think uh, mm -hmm. this is also an important point to consider. Yeah. Yeah, but maybe this time we spend more because when it, it comes to you, to you as endoscopy, to you as nurse, to you as a technician, maybe you are willing to spend a bit more because I mean, <laughs> it's a self protection. Consider yeah. it a self protection. It's so nice to say, but it's self protection. <laughs> it's the instinct yeah. of survival. Yeah. Okay. But don't say it. Yeah, this is our questions for now, and I, I want to kind of move on with your presentation, uh, Professor Hassan, because it's also... We, uh, we... Thanks, Monique, because we, we only missed uh, 10 minutes. You did all to <laughs> cancel my talk. But, uh, no, but no, anyway, no, no, no. Uh, Ulrich already did the all of it. Uh, I mean, the audience should know that yesterday I should have gone first and Rick uh, later. Then Rick, oh, no, can I go first? Since I'm gentleman, I said, <laughs> okay, Ulrich, you go first. And then she presented all our position statements. Uh, that's unfair, Rick. Next time you go last, very last, Rick. <laughs> but you're a gentleman, Professor Hassan, right? 
Yeah, of course, I was left. Right. It was not the discussion. <laughs> So yeah, okay, then we can so, we can yeah. move on with your presentation, uh, Professor Hassan, oh, and then give me the tool. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, so probably I can I can do it by myself now. <laughs> Assad, don't make it difficult for me. Ah, okay. Sorry, I need to do like this. Okay. So now I want to tell you why we did the update. Uh, of the position statement of the European society. And uh, let me thank Pentax because this is the first opportunity to present our new update that will be available on the PubMed uh, probably in the next few uh, days. So today in Europe, uh, we are much better. As you may see, the number of cases per day is less than 20,000. Please consider that we are 700 million so this means one case per 30,000 person. And this is the first good news for you. The second is that we are at least 10 times, I repeat, 10 times better than uh, United States. And let me be proud of it, because usually we are always underrated against United States, but this time, uh, probably because of a prolonged lockdown, we are in a much uh, uh, safer situation. And uh, this is um, the a current prevalence of the infection. As you may see, every week we have a similar situation in all European countries with about 1,000 cases. Each country always feels to be better than the surrounding countries. So Italy feels to be better than France, France better than UK. But when you look at this map, Europe is overall at a similar uh, stage. But this uh, slide also tells you that the virus is not over. So we are out from the epidemic phase, uh, but we entered in an endemic phase. So I know that endemic is not the right word, uh, but uh, for us as endoscopists uh, is the one we uh, understand the more. So please consider that the virus is not over. It is endemic. It's not epidemic uh, anymore. And this explains why the European Society with uh, Ulrike decided to update uh, the position statement. Because uh, we want to say, look, we are not uh, epidemic anymore, but we still need to do a lot. So don't think that we can relax because maybe tomorrow in Italy there are zero cases. Oh, zero cases, I can go back uh, to 100% of my capacity. Absolutely not. It is the opposite. We are winning. We should not uh, uh, reduce our uh, uh, defenses. So uh, the two society decide to recommend to continue to apply all the policies that were in the outbreak, also in the post lockdown. Despite this, may require time, as we discussed uh, before. This apply also to. Um, distancing, masking, uh, isolation, separation. I know it's not easy to have two waiting rooms, uh, but this is what uh, should be uh, required. You need to continue to use uh, a PPE as you were doing before. I also want to uh, show that this is aligned with the last recommendation that you may see is 29 June by the World Health Organization. So the two uh, endoscopy society are well aligned with the uh, World Health uh, uh, Organization in the need of uh, preserving all our uh, measures. This is from our previous uh, statement where we recommended uh, uh, the uh, triage one day before. Now, in the new position statement, Rick, uh, we decide to anticipate even to one week before, especially for those undergoing. Uh, uh, colonoscopy. But this, of course, must be repeated uh, the same day of the uh, endoscopy. Uh, what questions? I feel that these criteria are still uh, appropriate. It's about uh, symptom, it's about contact, it's about occupational hazard, it's about traveling, it's about uh, shielding. Of course, uh, consider that the long term. Uh, care facilities uh, and any closed area uh, may be especially at risk. For instance, also prisons can be clustered 
of uh, uh, disease. Uh, this is what uh, uh, hygiene uh, infection control means in the era of uh, COVID-19. It's not only about us, it's also about patients. So patients must be aware that their uh, safety is also in their own hands. So it is patients who need to have uh, hand hygiene with alcohol-based solution, who need to use uh, a mask, and then of course it is to us uh, to use uh, um, PPE. So let me say something about uh, mask versus respirator. First, there is no evidence that uh, FFP2 is uh, so much better than a mask, but there are technical uh, characteristics that suggest that FFP2 may be better. So there is no clinical evidence, but there is technical evidence. So if there is no shortage in your unit of FFP2, please use it for all procedure, for low risk and high risk patients. As Ulrich was suggesting, please use it for uh, reprocessing. On the other hand, and we'll come back to this, if you have a shortage of masks, uh, and this is the case of Italy, for instance, uh, uh, you can use surgical masks for low risk patients, especially for colonoscopy. I know this is extremely controversial, but please consider that in colonoscopy, also the patient uh, has the mask. So this is a double uh, protection. And uh, the uh, new uh, update also contain a very controversial uh, um, recommendation, and I think that uh, Ulrich forgot to mention it in uh, her presentation. So in uh, this update, we decide to take position on whether to recommend or not uh, um, a PCR testing before endoscopy for all patients when uh, considering that uh, very big, important, influential countries like uh, uh, France, with, with less Austria, are moving in that direction. This is also the direction of the United States of America. So should we test uh, all patients with a PCR two, three days before, and then you self-quarantine them until the uh, procedure? We feel that this is an extremely effective uh, a strategy, and if there are enough uh, uh, resources, uh, this uh, may be performed. This may be performed also to go back to full capacity with all elective uh, procedures. And this was supported uh, by this data that the reverse transcriptase uh, has an incredible sensitivity when matching with prevalence, the negative predictive value is virtually 100%. So should we in Europe move everyone to a, a test and scope uh, uh, strategy? I feel this would be desirable, but uh, it's not uh, uh, absolutely necessary. There are several areas in Europe where the actual prevalence of the disease is probably about one every five or six thousand of uh, cases. It was shown that the test and scope strategy is cost effective for a prevalence of about one every 1,000. So I guess that uh, each country needs to look in itself. If there are some hot area with still a reasonable risk of uh, transmissible COVID-19, uh, the uh, test and scope strategy is probably the best response. If not, you cannot go back uh, to elective endoscopy anymore. Having said that, if there are areas where there is virtually no new case uh, uh, in a day of COVID-19, uh, probably these areas uh, would not uh, benefit from uh, test and scope strategy in a cost-effective manner. But I advise you to go to Mike Wallace's uh, article on the GIE, and you can read all the a sensitivity analysis. I guess that uh, most of your units are experiencing uh, a lot of uh, need of uh, administrative work because we need to select the indication and to select those that are at higher risk of uh, uh, cancer. And this requires a lot of effort by physician and the nurses and all the uh, administrative. So what did we do? We recommended um, a return to full capacity 
PET-CT in endoscopy only, in those very few areas where there is no evidence of community uh, transmission. For instance, here in Italy, we feel that this moment can be uh, after December, so after the end uh, of the uh, year. And this is also supported by the WHO. This comes from the WHO. As you may see, there are three stratus, no case of COVID-19 in one day, cluster of cases, uh, non-community transmission. A lot of European countries are in between cluster and community transmission. For instance, here in Rome, we have very few new cases per day, but we have from time to time a new cluster. So it's recommendable only a gradual return to full capacity, and we will take time, as I said, uh, until December of this uh, year. And this was also the idea by the by Glems is this very nice article that I recommend everyone to uh, read. And this is from our uh, first position statement. Uh, all the prioritization of indication, you can use this document also for legal reason in delaying and postponing all surveillance procedure in low risk uh, um, patient. This is the last slide that is a very provocative slide. Uh, maybe we can be ready to go to gradual um, increase of capacity, but a lot of patients are uh, uh, have a fear to come to our hospital because they could get uh, uh, infected, so there is a balance between a fear of infection and fear of cancer. And I feel that uh, we need to be proactive in uh, convincing all patients at high risk of cancer to come, but also to take all precaution in patients at high risk from a severe COVID-19 infection, so much the elderly, the one with comorbidities, uh, and uh, blah, blah, blah. So I feel that with COVID-19, uh, hygiene control requires more uh, a team working and more um, reciprocal trust uh, with the patient. Three o'clock, I have one minute delay, I go back to Monique. Thank you very much, Professor Hassan. Um, so we have, uh, yeah, we've reached the time limit. Um, but actually, if everyone's okay, we might keep running for another 10 minutes. I think we've had some lively discussions. We've had a, have a lot of um, more questions from the from the audience. And I think, you know, if we're, um, we see that we're providing a lot of value and if it's okay with everyone, we'll continue. And for those of you that have to, have to go away due to prior commitments, uh, the recording for this webinar will be available on our Pentax Medical LinkedIn channel for you to view the parts that you missed. So um, then we keep on going. Uh, I would just like to just quickly check the question here um, that's come in here. So um, yeah, we have a question here from Krista. Uh, do you think there should be infection control validation on a regular basis, like on the washing and drying equipment on the endoscopes? Uh, and if so, how often? So maybe we can, um, bring Paul into this uh, question. Great, thank you. Yeah, well, it's a good question. I think there should always be an annual audit on endoscopy reprocessing, uh, which is also recommended for many years, of course. Um, and um, yeah, I think there should be more testing, uh, periodic testing uh, with microbiology or or the test, uh, quick test, protein test, or ATP can also be used. But uh, also uh, sampling endoscopes is a good quality um, for for uh, ensure your quality in reprocessing. Uh, you can sample the endoscopes, but also the the last rinsing water of the endoscope disinfector. But okay. it's of course uh, it costs a lot of uh, it costs time and it costs money. But you have a, a good uh, in uh, view on your reprocessing, on the outcome of your reprocessing, on the end product. And that's the endoscope. And of course, you have the the parameters uh, of the endoscope washer. But there are still some countries with a manual disinfection. Yeah. 
Yeah, in, in addition to the uh, maintenance of the machine, you have to do an annual validation of your washer yeah. disinfector. That is um, re uh, recommended according to 15883, and yeah. this should be Correct. done. And it easily recognizes also um, failures, uh, damages, and so on of the machine. So it must be done. Yeah, mm -hmm. and it should be scheduled also, and that is what Cesar also says. It is teamwork because. Yeah. Sometimes it doesn't, uh, the validation are not performed because it costs a machine and it costs production and endoscopy. And this is what we learned now from COVID-19. And this is the lesson we learned, I think. Yeah, whilst we're still in the endoscopy reprocessing room, we have another question here, uh, actually from earlier that we didn't touch on. Um, so um, is the splash dangerous for cross-contamination transmission? And with splash, they're meaning the risk during manual pr uh, reprocessing phase. Now, uh, Monika, wait one second before Ulrich uh, replies. I mean, Ulrich, we can have a lot of splash. We can also have a splash when we do a biopsy or when mm -hmm. we do uh, a polypectomy or when uh, we put the sphincterotome. So there's a lot of splash. Uh, around the industry. Should you protect yourself more with COVID-19? But th therefore, I think it is, uh, that should be also our learning point that we um, should really uh, cover ourselves during the procedure, yeah? And um, <clears throat> to, to not only for COVID patients or, or infectious patients, but also for normal procedures that we use um, uh, gowns uh, and not only gloves and that we use masks and uh, glasses or, or these protection shields. I'm really a fan of that. And the same is with reprocessing. Yeah, um, We also need protection shields or these shields at the, at the sinks and that avoid the contact with the splashes. Yeah, so I think that is really essential. Yeah, and Monique, let me say that this was also something where uh, Rick didn't convince me in the first place, but now I'm convinced. It's the use of uh, facial shield. I agree with Rick that they, they make sense. They are easy to use. Uh, they don't give any problem. They don't alter the transmission. You can see the face. You can see the reaction of the eyes, etc. So it makes sense. So I, I must admit, Rick, that uh, probably you were right. Uh, yeah, there, there is also very I mean. nice. Uh, there's also a very nice publication which shows what is on these protection shields yeah after a day of uh, endoscopy so that is useful mm -hmm. yeah. okay so we um maybe we should just swiftly move on to um the next part Ulrika, uh just to briefly discuss um with, with regards to the compliance and then we'll finish off with uh, we have two more questions and then yeah let's see what comes in Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So just again with the numbers, it, uh, I found that very interesting. When we see, uh, um, have a look at the infection rates of healthcare workers, so it differs a lot within Europe and Ireland. There have a high um, infection rate rates among healthcare workers, while in France a lower. So, but the reason the reason why we can't um, uh, answer this question, but uh, th this is what we have to keep into account, and also the different um, infection rates among doctors, nurses, and um, uh, nursing assistants. We did a survey um, in with ESG and SGNA, and uh, Cesare will present the uh, doctor survey. I will do the nurses survey, just to give you some um, information about how. Um, the um, how the uh, COVID uh, outbreak was managed. And interesting for us was to see that the uh, European guidelines, in addition to local and national guidelines, are quite accepted and uh, uh, are guidance uh, which are followed. Um, um, so uh, that, that was very good to see that uh, our work um, is useful and that the guidelines really help um, uh, nurses and doctors on site. For um, for the education, we asked, uh, did you receive enough information? And uh, the majority said yes. But surprisingly, um, in, in contrast to that, they said um, the majority said that we are only partly prepared to manage the pandemic. That can also be the reason because uh, the uh, COVID is a new infection and we don't know what happens with us. And so perhaps that's, uh, this is also the reason why. Come on, no? 
doesn't move it. Yeah, now it's moving. So um, we also asked the nurses, um, how do you how uh, have you felt during the pandemic? And it was um, good to see that the majority said, oh, in the usual state, I can manage that. A few were really exhausted, and that were people who really uh, were redeployed, especially to intensive care and outpatient clinics. Um, so um, the majority said, um, we usually do our reduced, uh, we do a reduced uh, uh, list um, and also with the emergency cases, but the work changed and um, the, um, the, uh, the virtual uh, consultations uh, increased and um, what um, um, Cesar already said, patients are afraid to um, come into endoscopy and they also cancelled uh, the procedures. But for those who are left in the, in the endoscopy rooms, they um, really um, had to do that um, work. And so uh, that, that might be also the reason why a lot of people said yeah, they are exhausted um, in endoscopy. Um, we also asked what uh, has changed with your workflow and it was good to see that these physical barriers increased that uh, you, um, nurses really established that physical areas, the um, separate waiting areas, re uh, recovery room, and also these negative pressure rooms are not very well established. I think we have to work on that, and, but that is very difficult to establish when the uh, departments are very small. Um, we heard a lot of shortages of PPE, and when, when we heard about yeah, PPE, everyone is thinking about masks, but there was a shortage of masks, yes, but there was also a shortage of gowns, and uh, that is what we have to keep in mind when we uh, order our stuff um, and our um, equipment. We also have to take care of the gowns, not only on the masks. Um, we also ask um, the nurses, um, are you worried um, to be infected with uh, SARS-CoV-2? And you see the majority says, no, no, I'm not so worried about it. I feel well protected. But when you keep in mind that we don't have enough uh, personal protective equipment, the majority said, yes, I'm worried that I bring the infection to my family and um, to my um, to uh, my patients. So that is another point what, we've, uh, what we saw in the survey. And another last point I would like to mention is um, that um, we um, had um, also nurses who a few were positive, a few who had to go into quarantine, uh, a large number, larger number who was negative, but also a, a big amount of, um, let's say more than 50% who had no idea are they positive or negative? They had no symptoms yet, but we also know that we have, let's say, secret ca carriers. And um, there, was, there were also nurses who said, I had symptoms, but I was not tested. And I think we have to keep into account that we really have to do the self-assessment and uh, the regular testing. I think it's important for, among healthcare workers and um, healthcare workers can also become vectors of onwards transmission. I think that is what we have to keep into account. That were my results. So we can switch to um, Cesare. Yeah, thank you, Ulrika. Um, just going back to the uh, the last slide, you know, I think um, uh, there is um, a nice kind of bridge here to, to the end. I think Cesare will um, skip over this this part so we can we can answer the rest of the questions. Um, Chazara, what do you think? Given the time, it's quarter past three. Okay, we can we to... keep, can we quickly go through his slides? Yeah. D would you like to um, let me just? Uh, no, no, no. Oh, there he is. No. Okay, so uh, Ulrika, it's user you. you... You took all the time, so no, 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 no. <laughs> In between the ESG and Esgena, Esgena is 75 and the uh, ESG is 25 percent. No, uh, talking apart, uh, I feel that Pentax will be very generous and will include my slide uh, in the, the webcast you can download uh, 
later. I mean, my slide that tells the same as uh, Ulrich, there is a lot of a shortage of uh, human factor infrastructure. But I feel that, uh, Monique, I feel that we are closing. Do you have other questions? We have actually one question. Maybe we can do the question and then because we're recording um, the session, let's continue with your part and um then everybody can can see the slides i think uh, it would it would be nice so the we've already had some people um that have given some really positive feedback um so i think uh, if it's okay with you we continue then with your slides yeah, but one yeah, okay. so rick can uh, i mean I, I'm, both of you can uh, stay also paul can come uh, very briefly mm -hmm. uh, there is a shortage of uh, uh training uh, one every two endoscopy is not uh, appropriately trained uh, in uh, using uh, uh, PP, etc. And um, uh, Asad, can you give me control? Okay, so uh, there is a lot of uh, unit uh, that, do, that don't do triage before, the, uh, one week before, probably because they don't have uh, manpower to do that. And uh, th there are one every three center that is interested in uh, using uh, a PCR. So I feel that our recommendation uh, was somewhat along the expectation uh, of the endoscopy community. This, this is quite dramatic because this come from no more than uh, three weeks ago. And uh, probably one every uh, three center uh, still use, uh, I mean, no, sorry, one every two center have a shortage uh, of N95 uh, and one every three, even uh, of surgical mask. This means that you need to use the same mask uh, for more patients, but this may be at risk because actually masks are considered not reusable. What about the use of uh, FFP2 for low risk? one every two center three weeks ago had this availability one every two no so we can recommend only uh, n95 because one every two center would be out of uh, uh, standard of uh, uh, practice uh, this is very interesting because uh, paul said a lot of time bronchoscopy bronchoscopy because bronchoscopy is aerosol generated procedure we don't know if uh, ESCP, EUS, uh, upper endoscopy are aerosol generated procedure, but uh, for most of the endoscopies, yes. So we, as the endoscopy society, support the idea that this uh, procedure are aerosol generating procedure. It is tough to, it is easy to stop, very difficult to restart. Uh, this is the idea we had. Uh, a lot of center virtually stop every endoscopy, and uh, they did only urgent endoscopy or I don't know, just EMR for. Uh, High grade displays in Barrett, uh, ESD for uh, elegastic cancer, uh, et cetera. How to replan? This is not easy, guys. Yeah, it's not easy to replan endoscopy because we, we are not back to full capacity. Maybe we are back to 50% of it was before, and we have plenty of uh, waiting lists. So we need to reschedule uh, very carefully our patients, selecting, selecting, and uh, um, selecting. So uh, back to you, Monique. Thank you very much, Professor Hassan. Thank you. That was uh, very efficient. <laughs> Thank you, and very, very, very informative. Um, I can review the recording, so everything will be on the recording. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, so we have a few more questions here. So uh, now all of our key experts are back, and thank you again to all of our participants for the multitude of questions. It's really generated such lively discussions. So um, we have a, um, a comment here about the microbiological testing of the endoscopes. Um, the experience shows that a lot of mistakes are performed while testing the endoscopes. Um, does a kind of workflow or poster exist showing the best way of sampling? Yeah, this is a very good question, Monique. Before Paul replies, uh, Paul, but do we have a standard? for this culture because every country I go, a different standard uh, I meet and, uh, and this explains the big difference in between center yeah. and between country. Yeah. Um, yeah, there are different guidelines and 
procedures to how to sample uh, endoscopes. So yeah, it would be nice to have just one simple worldwide endoscope sampling program because it's just one problem in all those countries. And we have for, only for Europe, we have 27 different guidelines on how to sample an endoscope, for example. But there, <laughs> I see Ulrike, yes, um, we should have a European guideline on it. We, we already we already have a European yeah. guideline, but it is from yeah. 2007, and we are yeah. now in the process of updating that guideline. And there are really a lot of problems to find, or a lot of issues to find the right um, solution, the right way of sampling. So, so the aim is really to have um, uh, a European-wide accepted um, mm -hmm. procedure of sampling and of culturing. That is also a problem. So yeah. we are working on that, yes, and hope to have that um, by the next year. But it, it, it's a competition between microbiologists, I think. Yeah, also. also this, uh, yeah. Depending, there, there are a lot of discussions in, uh, at the yeah. moment among microbiologists of the way of culturing which uh, solution should you use, uh, how should you sample, um, should you use a flush brush flush method, um, etc. PP. So there are a lot of open questions and there is some research running at the moment. Yeah. Yeah. It is a big I issue. I know it the is FDA a big, has a big a, issue. Yeah. 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 And the FDA has a sampling procedure for uh, duodenoscopes. Also. Yeah, yeah but, but we will do a European oh. one, which covers yeah. all uh, channels. So, but we all don't the, go into yeah. anything. <laughs> no, that's, a, that's the, the main question, part of the problem. Yeah, I was just. We have another question here from Daniela, but I think Ulrike, you just answered it in your in your topic. And Daniela, please let us know if if you have further questions. Um, regarding yes, the sampling. Let us listen to Daniela question. Oh, she just asked uh, if it was would be suction or flush sampling. And so Ulrika mentioned that, um, yeah. yeah, already. It, yeah, the question is flush, brush, flush. I think that will be perhaps the most effective way. Mm -hmm. And then there okay. is a discussion of the sampling liquid. Yeah, that's another yeah. point. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Daniela. Yeah. Yeah, and so I, I think, uh, Ulrika, you had a really nice uh, end uh, slide for your presentation with regards to teamwork, and the, th uh, the three of you have already touched on this. And I guess my question to you all is that, do you see a change due to COVID-19 regarding the teamwork between clinicians, nurses, and reprocessing units with regards to endoscopy? I would say absolutely. So I feel that now the the need of uh, infection prevention control throughout all the endoscopy, the fact that here everyone is at risk for its own safety, uh, boosts the, the team working. So I guess that uh, uh, frequent meeting, even uh, every day, briefing the briefing, uh, uh, the communication is more difficult with all of this uh, stuff. So you need to have uh, a team uh, feeling in order to communicate what to, uh, do so. I feel that the COVID-19 really impacted the, the human factor, while uh, the duodenoscope contamination uh, impacted uh, the technology, as we saw with uh, Paul. So COVID-19 uh, uh, left this lesson that we need to work as a team, uh, and probably this is the only good uh, of this infection. We have a nice comment here from Daniela. She said, "Nurses are always team players." That's it. That's it. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> we are more individualists. So we are mm. more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I, I guess this is a nice kind of lead into. Uh, so this is all of our questions so far, and uh, it's a nice kind of lead into the conclusion and really bringing us back full circle into the webinar title. Is has COVID nineteen really changed the focus and uh, and attention or importance on hygiene and infection control and um, I guess this is then a, a question, my last question to you all. Um, do you do you feel or do you think or what you see in your in your daily um, practices 
Uh, has the awareness improved with regards to hygiene and infection control in endoscopy due to COVID-19? I would say Absolutely. yes, yeah. a lot. Mm -hmm. Maybe more than we did with endoscope uh, contamination. So mm -hmm. COVID-19 was really yeah. a change. I mean, it was a respiratory, yeah. so it's really different. Yeah. And okay. it, it, it also gives a broader view, not only focus on duodenoscopes, but mm -hmm. with COVID, we really yeah. had a global, a more global view on that. And it yeah. touched a lot of different things. So from yeah. the organization, lo uh, logistics, and then uh, the, the procedure itself, the reprocessing, all comes now together. Then yeah. uh, let me say there was also yeah. a lot of fear. I mean, there was a lot of fear, yeah. not in the ASC, especially for instance in Milan, uh, surrounding area we must pay tribute to all of those endoscopies i mean there was fear now it's better yeah mm -hmm. yeah a nice kind of combination of a focus on on the efforts of the people let's say working as a team and the knowledge yeah. and sharing that knowledge on the products what products are available in order to kind of minimize infection and also on the processes such as reprocessing and training and everything kind of all comes together in, in, a, in a nice way. Um, but I would like to take this opportunity to thank all of the key experts here, Professor Hassan, Ulrika Bailenhoff and Paul Cesar for your value contribution today and uh, sharing your knowledge. Um, it's very much appreciated and we've had some nice comments in, in, in the comment box already. So thank you very much. And uh, for the participants, Monica, uh, let us thank uh, Pentax for persisting on uh, hygiene and infection control. Thanks, Pentax, to, to continue to focus on this. This is very much available, and I think this is a very good uh, way to serve our community. Thanks. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, and just um, uh, Asad, could you go back one slide? So um, we will continue. This is the last of our webinar series for COVID-19. And uh, we will take a break uh, now until September, and we will start a new hygiene-focused webinar series uh, from September onwards. So stay tuned to our uh, Pentax Medical LinkedIn page for registrations and for more information coming in the next month. Um, and we would like to, um, yeah, just advise everybody or remind everyone we have a live academy next week. Um, out of the hygiene topic, a little bit uh, focused more on um, AI. And so Professor Timo Rath from, uh, from Germany will do two live colonoscopy um, patient cases and will be available for a live chat afterwards. So if you haven't already registered and you would be interested, go to our Pentax Medical LinkedIn page and uh, join us next week. So with that in mind, I would also like to extend the thanks to all of the participants for your, for your contribution to the community especially in COVID-19 times, but also in your daily commitment in your profession. So yeah, I wish you all a nice morning, evening, night, day, wherever you are in the world. And we have a big global community and we we'll stay tuned for the next one. So thank you all very much. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. Okay, take care. Bye. Bye.